yeah, we were driving separately, and I wanted to beat her to Sobeys, and I did. I took the win, so it was a good day. <laughs> always, were you aware that you were in the middle of a race? <laughs> I was aware. I was aware, but I didn't try. I like it's not a time to get into an accident. <laughs> Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Piaro, and with me is Matt Hansen. Hi, Matt. Hello. And also joining me from the West is Terry McCall. Hello, Terry. Hey, good to be here. All right. As always, I'm feeling the stoke from you guys. Just the energy. It's buzzing. Really exciting stuff. We do have some exciting stuff to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. There's been some notable road racing action of late. Also track cycling uh, right in uh, our backyard, Matt, you and I, in our backyard here in Southern Ontario. And Terry, you're recently back from Sea Otter, which is, of course, uh, a notable event in the bike industry where there's lots of cool gear and also a bit of racing. So since we have a lot to cover, let's get into it. So the big world tour race of late was Liège, Baston Liège, La Doyenne, the old lady. Let's start with the men's race there, Matt. <sighs> Poor Pogachar. Yeah, well, that was a bummer, right? I have to say, for a guy who, I mean, pretty much wins every single race, I don't think he ever quits a race. But uh, thankfully, you know, he did break his wrist there, but it looks like he's going to be off his bike for four or five weeks. But he had a smile on his face. But yeah, that was the duel was quickly <laughs> undone. Yeah, yeah. And I know, thankfully, your thankfully is that it looks like he'll be ready to race in about six weeks. It's still, you know, we're still waiting for like a full confirmation of that. But, you know, signs point to that at the moment. I think with Liège, it's almost like Roubaix, we were we were hoping for a duel and there was a crash or in case of uh, Wout van Aert at Roubaix a puncture that denied us the the duel we were hoping for that when we signed up this year and last year you've had a lot of duels between the you know the big two and the big three so you know not every race can go according to plan but yeah it was a bummer for Pogacar Mm -hmm. and then Remco of Vendepol uh just crushed it Pitcock tried he tried he was almost there but you saw you saw Evenepoel uh, kind of give him the old elbow flick, and Pidcock just shook his head. And I don't think it, as I understand it, it was it wasn't just a matter of like, no, I'm not going to cooperate. But I don't think he could at that point. I think he was done. I think again with comparison to Roubaix, uh, another uh, monument, the women's race was far more exciting in the case of Liège Baston Liège. Yeah, I mean, like Remco basically just, we waited until the hill, and then he took off on the hill, and that was the race, right? Well, from pretty far out, though, yeah. Yeah, I know, but still, you know, it was just one decisive moment, whereas the women, there was there was some action there between SD Works just dominating again, so that was that was a little more exciting. It was, and then there was Trek um, also in the mix, and um, the thing with the women's race is that if you just look at the results, Demi Volring wins, you might just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that coming. But the way the race played out was pretty exciting with her, her teammate Marlon Royce away. And they, uh, I think it was on the final climb, they pretty much did a swap. Uh, Royce was away with uh, uh, Elisa Longo Borghini, and then Volering bridges across, and then uh, Royce drops back. And it came down, of course, to a sprint between Elisa Longo Borghini and Demi Volering. Um, and yeah, Volring, she took it for the triple. It's a hell of a spring for her. Hell of a spring indeed. And her team, I guess, too. I mean, they're everywhere. Allison Jackson. She is still getting on podiums. A couple of them. Within two weeks of Perry roubaix she takes a bronze in the Pan Am Champs time trial. And then a few days later, silver in the road race. And, you know, shout out to Amber Neben there who won the time trial. I think she's uh, 48 or something like that. And she's been racing for 
a long time, and she still got it. It's kind of impressive. On the men's side, national champion Pierre-Andre Cote won the road race. And in third was his human-powered health teammate, Charles Etienne Chrétien. Yeah, it was sort of a it was sort of a dream for it to see the blue, white, and red there. You know, all right at the. It would have been cool to get one too, but one and three ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, definitely. But just seeing just seeing Kretchen with his arms up in the air as he sees his teammate win is is always nice, right? Terry, tell us about sea otter. You know, there's lots of gear to peruse at sea otter. You were there with other members of Canadian Cycling Magazine. What is one, no, what are three things that caught your eye? Um, yeah, I think the the big thing was Specialized finally uncovered their Epic World Cup that its team has been racing around the world for the past few months. Um, and it's the one that looks, well, it looks a lot like Trek Super Caliber, though there are some important differences in the design. Um, I think it's interesting, not just because it's a new bike, because it's kind of a correction to the trend of XC bikes having more and more travel over the last few years. Uh, And this is obviously a very race-focused bike, which has pros and cons for consumers, but for the racers, it's uh, it's interesting to see that stuff coming out before Paris. Um, And then there were two smaller designs from Canadian brands. Um, Trino's Bridge Bicycle Works was teasing a carbon fiber threaded bottom bracket uh, so instead of having an aluminum insert go into the bottom bracket so you can thread your BB in, the threads are part of the frame. They're molded in. And it's just kind of wild that they can do that. Um, and then last thing was Project 321. This brand started in Bend, but it's now manufactured just outside Toronto uh, and owned by a Canadian company. Um, and they, they've had their magnetic pole design for a long time, basically since the brand started. But at Sea Otter, they were showing off a center lock to six bolt conversion, like a, instead of the usual kind of ugly lock ring that goes on if you want to put a center lock or convert a center lock to six bolt. This one's much smoother, and 321 is going to send out their hubs automatically with this. So instead of buying a really high end hub where you have to commit to six bolt or center lock, you can run either. Um, and I don't know, that sounds small and weird, but it was really well done and it's really cool to see. I'm actually really keen on that as someone who's, you know, been testing wheels and been swapping rotors back and forth. Sometimes it can be a real pain to, to make those swaps happen. So I think that, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. And tell me more about magnetic pawls. Usually Pauls uh, are spring activated and they they catch within the free hub. But wh- what's a magnet or what are magnets doing in there? Um, so this is the, the design that 321 came up with and Stans is using in their impulse hubs um, that are also partly manufactured by 321. And it just uses the magnetic forces instead of a spring to keep the pulse from engaging. It's supposed to roll a lot smoother, a lot faster while still having really high engagement. Science. Science, there you go. (laughs) And Terry, uh, gear isn't the only thing at Sea Otter. There was a lot of racing. Tell us about some of the racing action out there in California. Yeah, so Sea Otter has always had a lot of amateur racing pretty much any time, any hour of the day. There's someone racing in and around the venue, but the big race right now is the Lifetime Grand Prix. Uh, And this was the first event in the second year of that series. Haley Smith won the first year, and she was on the podium again this year, uh, which is a great start to her title defense, and a bit better than she did at this event last year, so that's cool. And then Andrew Lesperance was also in the top 10 on the men's side of what looked like a very hard 110-kilometer mountain bike race. We were looking at some of the numbers for that, too. It's pretty bonkers, the average watts that some of the, the, the winners did. 110 kilometer mountain bike race yeah in four hours yeah yeah like these are endurance events but they're not riding endurance pace this episode of the canadian cycling magazine podcast is supported by ms bike the first ms bike events of the season are about six weeks away which still gives you time to fundraise and boost your fitness. If your event is in July, like Grand Bend to London in Ontario, 
or maybe it's in August, like Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia? If so, you can start a 12-week training plan from MS Bike. It was developed by coaches we work with here at Canadian Cycling Magazine. You'll find that training plan on the MS Bike website. Then, once you show up to the event, you'll be fully supported with food, drinks, roadside support, and first aid. So, if you haven't already, sign up for MS Bike. Did you know that one in 400 Canadians lives with MS? You can help. Give your riding some focus and some purpose. Head to msbike.ca, register, and start fundraising. Uh, yeah, I think the only thing I brought home from Sea Otter was a pair of jean shorts and uh, jean pants for from Ripton and Co. in Colorado. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it actually jean material? Is it like actual denim? Oh, those are cool. But it's like a denim like remix kind of thing? No, it's just denim. It's like stretchy denim. It's very light. It's apparently made in Turkey. But they make like jean vests, jean pants. It's great. Oh, did you get some for me? <laughs> what size are you? I don't know. It depends on the day. <laughs> we'll see. I'll send them over. The uh, the jean shorts are in the mail, bud. Thanks, bud. Well, from the dirt, we go to probably Siberian spruce. I think that's the uh, the wood of choice for velodromes. Wow, I'm really impressed that you know that. If it's correct, I'm really impressed. I'm pretty sure it is Siberian spruce. Let me bing that for you. It's marine grade lumber of some kind. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. Anyway, the boards of Milton. Recently, the Track Nations Cup was there. This is the final stop on this season's three stop Nations Cup. It was pretty darn exciting. I was there in the infield pestering athletes and coaches uh, when they probably wanted to just, um, you know, take a breather. But uh, they were all very gracious and very insightful about uh, the racing they were doing and what's probably ahead for them on the boards as Worlds looms later this year and Paris 2024 is really not that far off. So a lot of work they're doing now is with the Olympics in mind. Well, also, the, they need to get the point. They need to get points, too, at this, at this last Nations Cup. So that was an important uh, event, I think. Yes, chasing those UCI points is always an important thing. Uh, you guys, you can sit back and relax. And here's a segment I produced from the Milton Nations Cup. The recent Track Nations Cup in Milton, Ontario, went pretty well for Canada's sprinters. Kelsey Mitchell won gold in the sprint. James Hedgecock was fourth in the Kieran, and the women's team sprint took silver. I spoke with members of the team sprint squad shortly after they received their medals. Lorien Genet, Sarah Orban, and Kelsey Mitchell took me through the roles each of them has as they race around the track, all out, for three laps. Also, Mitchell and Genet joked about a little competition they had that day that wasn't on the track. All right, can you say your names into the microphone, please? Lauren Genet. Sarah Orban. Kelsey Mitchell. All right, this is the women's team sprint. Silver here at Milton. My, question, my first question is, how did you guys decide the order in which you guys raced today? Sarah, can you tell me about that? Yeah, so we set our order based on, like, our specific strengths, and that's decided well before... Uh, race day like this is how we train we train very specifically in that position and they all kind of require different needs and yeah okay so tell me about position one which was your position today so p1 typically we ride a much smaller gear a lot snappier um higher rpm and then yeah it's quite different for p2 and 3 but they're more similar and position two kelsey uh, position two, I try and chase Sarah down basically and then try and hold a steady lap for low and dropping her off at speed. And in the closing uh, laps, what is what is that like? 
I need to relax as much as possible for two laps uh, to lose as less energy uh, as possible and then uh, just everything I have left really in the last lap. And how did you feel about today's performance? I think today was overall uh, really good. It was one of our best times. Uh, we really came together as a team and I think that was the most important part about it. And um, what do you think this Sarah, what do you think this says about like where you guys stand and, and, and what you guys have lined up in the future with your eyes you know, on um, Worlds and possibly Paris? We're definitely in contention for qualifying a spot to Paris and that is the main goal. It's a, a long process and you know, we're just, we have the big picture goal in mind and we're just going to keep working and building on what we've done today. Okay, here's a not so serious question. Kelsey, I know you're competitive in, in more ways than one, and you bring that competitive into your into your friendship with Lorian. Um, I've heard of competitions on getting upstairs as quickly as possible, eating food as quickly as possible. Were there any competitions today? Uh, All, off the track, I should say. Um, yeah, we were driving separately, and I wanted to beat her to Sobeys, and I did. I took the win, so it was a good day. It was always, were you aware that you were in the middle of a race? <laughs> I was aware, I was aware, but I didn't try. I like, it's not a time to get into an accident. <laughs> All right, so the lesson here is, you know, pick your battles, pick the races you want to excel in. All right, everyone, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. On the track, not only was there success for Canadian athletes, but frustration too. I spoke with Scratch Race world champion Dylan Bibick after the elimination race. You might not hear it in this interview, in his voice, but he was fuming. He finished 7th, but expected much better from himself. Still, in this short clip, he also shows his drive and dedication, which he mixes with a frank analysis. There's a reason he's a world champion. Dylan Bibbick, we're here at Milton. Uh, you just finished the elimination race. Uh, it didn't go the way you wanted. Tell me how you're feeling about that. Yeah, I'm not happy with it. I think I had the capabilities to, at the very least, get a medal, and I came out with seventh. So, yeah, it was just at a crucial point in the race where I got boxed in, I went under, and that get, made me get disqualified. It's a mistake. It's not going to happen again. I'm going to learn from this, and you're going to see I'm going to improve. And, uh, do well later. I'm really impressed with, um, I mean, I understand the frustration, but you're, you're already analyzing it and, and now you have a sense of what you're going to take away from it for the next time. Is, 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 that, is that fair? Yeah, no, uh, I already know what I did wrong and I think it's just uh, like in, 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 in the text, like in textbook, I know what I'm supposed to do, but in the race, it's just like maybe I just push it a bit more. Maybe I stay on this wheel a few more seconds, save a bit of energy and you wait three more seconds and you're boxed. It's it just, uh, I should have been more aware. I should have uh, been looking back, but you know, I've learned, I'm, I'm not even learned. I just like, just know I need, I can't be doing this. I need to be more aggressive. And what's next for you uh, on this weekend? Just the Madison with uh, Michael Foley. Should be good. I think we did this last year. I think I'm healthier, he's stronger. It'll be, uh, I, I, I think we'll have a good performance. And you're going to take a moment to reset, rechannel your energy? Yeah, no, it, it, that race wasn't hard. Like, in a limb, in my opinion, either, like, you're, you either get off and you're dying of, like, exhaustion and it's, like, really hard, or uh, you get off and you're just kind of mad and not tired, but you're just mad because you made a, a, a technical error. What's ahead for you for this season uh, beyond Milton? Uh, I'm going to go do uh, some road with Israel Premier Tech on the development team. And then uh, I think I, I'm probably going to do Pan American Championships uh, and then hone in on Worlds, um, all in on the Omnium, I hope. And uh, yeah, and then I think I have to make the decision uh, Champions League or Pan American Games. And I'm currently leaning more towards uh, Champions League. Why is that? Uh, I think it's, truthfully, it's, it's harder to win Champions League. You know, Pan American Games, it may seem pretty cool, but uh, truthfully, you're only versing like what? How many nations are in Pan America? Like 50? 40? Maybe less. But you have fewer at uh, the Champions League. Yeah, but you're, you're getting the Europeans and like uh, 
the Asians, which are just, they're just, uh, in my opinion, are worlds better than anyone in, uh, in, in North, in, in Pan America, generally speaking. Interesting. And and you were there last year, and I take it you, you, you appreciate that experience being at the Champions League. Yeah, no, it, I definitely learned, and, uh, but I, I'm ba I want revenge. I want, I want to make up for my performance last time, and I think I got too comfortable being world champion, and I was marked heavily, but uh, it's not going to happen again. I'm, I want it more now. Tell me that idea of being marked. I've, I've kind of heard that, that you are now a marked rider. Um, how do you, is there a way to deal with that? Yeah, it's weird because last year I was, uh, last year at this time I was a nobody in track cycling. Like sure, you know what, I had a junior title. That's insignificant in the world of elite cycling. Like they'll look at a junior world champion and not even think twice. But uh, now that I'm elite world champion, uh, racing's so different. Everyone goes into the race knowing Dylan Bibic. And uh, it just adds that extra kind of layer to the race where I kind of have to like know that things are not going to go the same. It's not, it make, maybe makes it a bit harder, but not, not any harder, like not difficult, not impossible to win. So I just need to work around it and anticipate for what people are going to do knowing I'm marked. Dylan, I appreciate your analysis and your candor. Um, good luck with the, uh, the season ahead. Yeah, thank you. The Canadian women's team pursuit squad snagged bronze in Milton. Maggie Coles Lister, Erin Atwell, Sarah Van Dam, and Ariane Bonhomme raced against the U.S., and man, it was dramatic. I must confess, after the first kilometer, I thought Canada wasn't going to be able to pull it off. Then they started speeding up, and then the U.S. squad fell apart. It turns out that's pretty much how the team had planned it. In this next clip, Maggie Coles Lister and Aaron Atwell break down their strategy. Atwell mentions Chloe, which is U.S. rider Chloe Digard, and how she factored into the plan. The two Canadians also talk about how the squad is progressing on the world stage. Aaron Atwell, Maggie Coles Lister. And uh, your teammates. <laughs> your, your teammate is just around. Now, you guys just uh, came off the award ceremony, bronze here in Milton. It was a nail biter of a race, Maggie. Tell us, like, what was your sense of how close it was during the race? I mean, we get lots of information from the coach from the side, so. Our plan was just to ride our own schedule for the first half and then really make it a race after that. And at the halfway point, we'd be given information based on where he was, whether we were like faster than them or slower than them. And then we could really try to just drive it and make it a race. Uh, so yeah, we rode to schedule for the first half and then that's what happened. We knew we were down. Uh, you don't really know how much you're down at that point, um, but uh, I knew for our team, if we can just keep our the three of us together and just maintain the pace, that there's a good chance uh, something could happen to the U.S. like what happened and they could blow apart and we could get it um, or just ride a better time. And so, yeah, that was kind of our Achilles heel. We just kept it together and uh, really proud of us because it hasn't quite been that way in the first two rides. So to pull it together in the final ride is always a special feeling. Aaron, can you tell us a bit about how the communication works that you're getting from the coach? Like, what, what does that look like? What do you see and what is your sense of the race from, from where you are? So uh, generally we have a plan for the first two kilometers and it's like, stay pretty conservative. You don't want to blow anyone out of the water quite yet because uh, the race is never won in the first two kilometers, but it can definitely be lost in the first two kilometers. So. Um, one rotation through takes us about 2K in, uh, so it's really important that we're getting the feedback from the coach and making sure that we're responding to the pace if we're up or, or, or you know, if we're slow or fast. But as soon as uh, we hit the 2K mark, like you can really start to like uh, put the pressure on the other team. Um, so my job today was to uh, set everyone else up so that they could have the best recovery possible going into the final two kilometers. So I just kept it pretty steady, put a little bit of pressure onto the U.S. because we knew that, you know, if 
if uh, Chloe, who's the really strong, strong one of the U.S., um, if she felt the pressure, she, sometimes she'd, she'd crack her teammates, and I think that's exactly what happened. So it was a bit of your race savvy, but also maybe what happened on the other team's part that uh, that affected the outcome. Is that a fair assessment, Maggie? That's a fair assessment. Uh, I mean, it's so hard to say whether they would have slowed down anyway and it would have been that kind of match. But I think, yeah, you have to go for it. But the fact that we rode a clean ride is what, like, I wouldn't say nine times out of ten, but often can get you through and get you that medal. So, Aaron, what does this tell you about uh, the Team Pursuit squad and how you guys are, are going and what it might mean for the future? I think we're at a really exciting point. Um, we've never been a team that goes sub 420, you know, in in the past, and we're under kind of new coaching at the moment, and he's he's taking us through our paces, and we're we're being pushed really hard in training, but we're doing some some training that's a lot different than what we've done in the past, and um, the environment's meant to be fun, and we're supposed to actually, you know, having a fun environment means that we can go fast, and we kind of really rely on one another and it's it becomes more of a team effort so I think moving forward if we're training together like we have been in the past few weeks I think we can do something really special the rate of progression in the last month has been amazing um, we've never been able to consistently ride under 420 so to be able to do that back to back to back has been amazing and would never have thought we were going to be able to do this a month ago so Maggie, do you guys feel the weight of history in terms of team pursuit? Because Canada, uh, there was some success, success at London and, and then again in Rio. Does that enter into your minds at all or do you guys got to keep it just focused on what's going on now? Oh, it definitely does. I mean, we have big Wait, shoes to you? fill and a great uh, legacy in team pursuit. But at the same time, we're also pretty much a brand new squad, except for Ariane Bonhomme. So we're kind of starting from scratch and rebuilding the program and learning how to ride these speeds that the other team could do. And I think if you look at our tra trajectory with times and results, we're definitely headed in the right direction. And like Aaron said, we're under new coaching right now. So a bit of a change up from what us as a development program have been doing for the past five years is I think kind of the refresher we needed right now to just bring new energy into the program especially this year and a half out from the games to be able to just keep that trajectory headed in the right direction because we're gonna have to go at least another 10 seconds faster than we did today over the next year and a half so just keeping this positive energy and just good vibes over that next year and a half and hopefully this coaching just keeps pushing us in that right direction. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank yeah, thank you. So you. Much. The coach that Atwell and Coles Lister mentioned is Richard Wolves. He's been working full time at Cycling Canada since the start of 2022. But Wolves was instrumental in building up track cycling in Canada throughout the 2000s and up to the London Olympics. He got a bit deeper into the strategy for the women's team pursuit at Milton just recently. There was just so much going on in 4 minutes and 16 seconds. Well, 4 minutes, 15.961 seconds, to be exact. Richard Wools, just coach at Cycling Canada. Uh, we were joking about your title just a second ago. Tell me about uh, the coaching you're doing right now with Canada's track athletes. I'm helping out at the moment. I was lucky enough to go to um, the last Nations Cup in uh, Egypt and I'm here helping out in Milton with a bit of a role with the women's endurance program but still coaching two or three of the, um, the male riders as well on the team. So here just helping out, filling in where I can. And what are you seeing in terms of the riders' progression um, Especially with regards to, say, Worlds coming up this year and, you know, the Olympics seem to be following fast on the last Olympics. So, yeah, what are you seeing in terms of their development with those uh, events on the horizon? Yeah, Olympics is just around the corner. It's going to be with us before we know it. So there's uh, huge potential in both of the teams, uh, male and female. 
Um, for me, coming here, the goal was to see if we could get on the podium and to try and do some predictable rides. So we did quite a few training sessions. We were running over full distance, um, trying to be able to, when you have four or five elements, how do you put them together and go as fast as possible? So that was something that I've really enjoyed doing in the past, of trying to find like how much can you do here and how much more load can we add to different people. So yeah, there's huge potential in them at the moment. We've got on the podium and I'm hoping they can aim for the podium at the next Olympics. That's right, the women's team pursuit uh, got bronze. And you're trackside and you're communicating with the riders. And tell me how that communication works and what you're actually trying to convey to them in the midst of the race. Well, there's a couple of strategies. You see quite a few different coaches doing lots of different things. So there's um, old school where we used to stand on the line and they'd have a pace strategy and we'd either walk towards them and that would be, oh dear, we need to speed up a little bit or you'd walk away from them. It was like, okay, you're above pace so we can chill a little bit. Um, you can be in the corner just shouting a number. So if the, we agreed on we were trying to do 15 fours or 15 sixes, you just shout five six as loud as you can and hopefully they hear it and that steadies the nerves a little bit. Um, and then for us, because once you get into a medal round, we don't really care about the time. It's just first team across the line. So there becomes another strategy in that. And we had a strategy to try and ride under control for the first two kilometers. And then we were racing against USA. And I would say there's one or two riders there that have a bit of a history of being unpredictable. You know, they're quite strong riders. So we tried to ride ours for the first two kilometers and then see if we could get them to react. So we tried to go quite fast for a, a lap or two and see if they would accelerate super hard and just break their team in half, which it was a strategy and we had a race on and talked to the, the team and said, let's just go for it. Half distance, we're just racing bikes. So first across the line. I find that so fascinating because the, the level of strategy and tactics, this almost sounds uh, like football-esque to me, like knowing your, knowing the strategy. And it's almost like, a co is this a coach's call or is it is it a rider's call to start implementing these strategies? Uh, a little bit of both, but when you come to the, the race, like if you're riding for a medal, then it, the coach has to make that decision because a rider will always second guess themselves. They'll always say, I, well, I'm not sure if I can do that or is this the right strategy? And then you just have to say, well, here's the strategy that we want to try. Have some trust in the strategy and you can adapt it. It's not remote control. I'm not writing, you know, you can decide if you want to do more or less. Um, so, but we just lay it out beforehand and it was lots of fun. It's nice for them to get up on the podium. And uh, so you've been involved with Canadian track cycling for many years. Uh, you were there in the lead up to 2012 in London. Um, are there, what are some maybe similarities and differences are you seeing between the program then and the program now? Uh, it's hard for me to, to say about that actually because I've only just started getting back into the program on the track. I was in Beijing and I did London and then started a family and I decided to take some time out. Um, so the, these couple of World Cups are really my reintroduction into it. But they're moving so fast now. The way that it's changed, the, the technology, people wearing under undergarments you know it's like uh you know spraying stuff on their chains and on their legs and you know and i've seen not here anymore but the people were using tape when they had no injuries to see if they get an airflow difference around their legs and you're just like this sport has changed it looks very different to what i was used to like 10 12 years ago and the gears are so big you know they're they're moving so fast now so once you get that boulder moving you can keep it but it is about, you know, can you get that start? You know, people have definitely changed the way that they train much more strength than in um, just overall endurance. Richard, thank you for this perspective. Appreciate it. No problem. One athlete who Wolves worked with in the late 2000s and early 2010s is Laura Brown. She's now a coach at Cycling Canada who works with the men's endurance athletes. At Milton, there were two men's team pursuit squads. The A squad was made up of Michael Foley, Dylan Bibic, Matthias Guillemet, and Carson Matern. They finished fifth in the standings. Laura Brown provided me with some context for that result, and not only what could lie ahead for the men's team, but also the women's. 
Laura Brown, Cycling Canada coach on the men's endurance side. We're here at the Milton Velodrome during the Nations Cup. Let's talk about the men's endurance program. Can you give us just sort of your sense of where the riders are at right now and how they're doing? It's a really exciting time for track cycling in Canada in general. And, and for me, I work with the men and it's an incredible time to be coaching the men's team. We have so much talent. We have you know, two junior world champions and we have returning Olympian and then, and then we just have so much depth. Like it doesn't stop there. We have so many guys in the program and, and then coming up through the program. So yeah, it's an exciting time. For sure, you've got those riders like Dylan Bibbick, Carson Return, and uh, yeah, they're doing <laughs> quite well yeah. <laughs> as an understatement. But um, let's talk about the men's team pursuit. Um, they were close to here in Milton, but not quite. Um, can you just give us a bit of a snapshot of their performance? For sure. I mean, we were stoked with our time, first of all. That's um, the fastest qualifying time that men's team pursuit has ever done in Canada, like at sea level, besides the Olympic Games. That's pretty awesome. Track PB for us, a team PB for like this particular squad. And to qualify third was really encouraging. Like, these guys are young, like teenagers and early 20s. And so just starting to see like what's possible with this group and the potential we have. And then in the rounds, we missed the finals by two tenths, which is such a small margin. And, and like we haven't even begun to, to work on details and, and you know, aero optimization and all that stuff. So it's really exciting. So that's interesting. There's sort of like, there's still some honing and polishing you can do. So yeah, making it, making further steps doesn't seem um, untenable. Is that fair? Yeah, we, have, we haven't even begun to realize our potential. Like, yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah. You did mention it's a young team. I believe that one of the more senior members is Michael Foley, who's a, a local. He, yeah. he like yeah. kind of grew up with this track. And now, and now, yeah, he's leading the team. Um, and uh, yeah, what kind of, like, how important is that to have like the, 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 that senior member helping the junior members? Oh, it's huge, that, that mentorship amongst the team. And he's only a few years older, but he's been to the Olympics and it's, they're a really group, great group of guys. And it's a lot of brotherly love and they support each other and, and I mean, they're young, young men too, so Mike kind of keeps everyone in line and is a good leader and teacher and patient. So it's really nice, really nice team dynamic. Now I want to switch to the other team pursuit because we um, are speaking shortly after the award ceremony for the women's team pursuit and Canada got bronze. Uh, tell me your feelings about that as a team pursuiter and Olympian yourself. I am so happy to see the women's team pursuit win bronze. In my career, I won a lot of bronze. It's almost like the curse of the bronze. We won so many, but um, yeah, just to see that team again get on the podium was so exciting, and I'm just so proud of proud of them. And again, a fairly young team and an experienced team. So yeah, they're going to go on to great things, and very proud of you know the legacy of the women's team pursuit. I work with the men, but I'm always. Very proud and interested in what the women are doing. All right, Laura Brown, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>
This episode was produced by Adam Killick. He did the music too. Thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. Guys, it's Paris to Ancaster this weekend. We're going to have national gravel champions crowned at this uh, this long-running Southern Ontario gravel race. Maybe Cycling Canada is going to debut a brand new, like, brown maple leaf jersey. You think? That'd be pretty wild. <laughs> Stylize it. If anyone's listening there, <laughs> make a new gravel national championship jersey. Bit of brown. The, 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 the maple leaf in fall. In jean shorts, yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Ride safe, and we'll talk to you later. Bye.